Hi, everybody. It's Matt Baer from discovercollegesoccer.com. I'm excited to kick off our inaugural podcast slash video slash interview, whatever you want to call it, um, with a good friend of mine, Leslie Fields, who, can you believe it's been 20 years? <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, it, you, blink, <laughs> uh, um, you blink and it goes by, right? Um, so... Uh, Leslie and I met in grad school, and when I left grad school, I went to a Division II school and coached college soccer for a couple of years, and in that 20-year span, Leslie's been primarily focused in college athletics on the compliance side of things, uh, and currently, Leslie, what, what's your title at, at Xavier? Director of Compliance. Director of Compliance. So um, for everybody out there not familiar, uh, let's start with, Leslie, what is the director of compliance do? Um, thanks, Matt. We, uh, you know, we, it's an important job because at the end of the day, we really are protecting the eligibility of all of our student athletes, but also the integrity of the athletic department and really the whole university. Because certainly if, if we always say that athletics is not even close to the most important thing that the university does, but we are the most visible. And so if there is some type of rule violation or scandal, that's what's going to be in the news. If, it, if that happens in the history department, that's not gonna be newsworthy, but if it happens with the soccer team, then that will be, that will be the headline. And so, and so we do that by, um, we do a lot of education and outreach. We, um, I mean, this is kind of an example of something that we do. We, we will go and talk to high schools locally and a lot of compliance offices do that. We'll come go and talk to high schools on, you know, their college night to talk about um, what it's like to be a student athlete um, and what the requirements are. Um, and then with our people here, there's again, lots of education because we do a lot of monitoring, but you can't be everywhere at all times. And so we try to be proactive and, and educate people to help avoid violations before they happen. And so, yeah, that's what we do. Just protect everyone. That's how we like to look at it. Some people look at it as police. Nah, we're- uh, <laughs> Secret service, secret service. You're protecting. <laughs> we're, we're right <laughs> <laughs> well, I, and and I think it's awesome. I, I mean, i one of the reasons I, I figured it was great to to kind of kick this whole thing off with you is is you know players and parents both don't necessarily even think about it right it's one of those kind of secondary things um and so you know I, I think it'd be it's good to hear from you specifically so so folks understand you know what all the different nuances are during the recruiting process while you're at school the whole idea behind eligibility and, and, and making sure that you can play once you get to that level, um, you know, by the, by the rules that the NCAA sets forth. And, and obviously for, for anybody listening or watching, you know, this is mostly, we're going to talk about NCAA rules. Um, the NAIA is a completely different organization with a completely different set of rules but they still have rules nonetheless. So if you end up going to an NAIA school, make sure that you understand these types of things from, from their uh, point of view. Um, so, so Leslie and I both have several children who enjoy athletics uh, and, and are fairly close in age. Um, so when, when do you think parents and kids should start thinking about, you know, their college athletic pursuits and and how to make sure that when they want when, when it's time for them to get there that they've done what they needed to do and are able to do that to do it i think you know by the time you start high school is probably the time to at least have the conversation with your high school guidance counselor to let them know hey i'm looking at perhaps being an ncaa student athlete and and that's division one, two, or three, there will be certain requirements, right? Um, and so just making your guidance counselor aware that that's your intent so that you're taking classes that will count toward NCAA eligibility. Um, for the NCAA, you know, you, you can't just take um, home ec classes the whole way through. And I mean, 
you won't graduate if you just do that, um, but also you won't meet NCAA standards. And so um, NCAA standards are that, it, I think this is division one and two both. You need 16 of what they call your core courses. And so that's English, math, science, social studies. And then there's some room for foreign language. Um, what will not count are typically um, religion classes, um, computer classes, business classes, which are all very valuable, but they're not in the core. So um, just make sure that you're each year you, you need to take an English. That's typically a graduation requirement too. Um, and then you'll need three years of math. And then um, you fill in the rest to get to the 16 with your, you can do more math, social studies, science, things like that. Um, and so to make sure that you're on track, I would, I would have the conversation freshman year, sophomore year. Um, you know, in division one, soccer coaches can't talk to recruits until they are juniors. So they might go and watch games, um, to evaluate, but they're not able to speak to them on the phone or return texts or emails, which is challenging for our coaches who, even if they're not recruiting a certain person if a, if a if a sophomore in high school or his or her parents call them like they're not allowed to call them back which is super awkward always or you run into them at the field and and the coach has to say I'm so sorry and see your rules I can't talk to you please know parents that is actually real and they're not just trying to brush you off I I know what my coaches always kind of struggle with that but um so yeah there's kind of a well, that's a, and, and that's a really good point. So, you know, I, I live down here in Bradenton, Florida. We're home to the premier uh, soccer complex, which hosts several national tournaments every year. Um, you know, the ECNL Florida event was here a few weeks ago, and I'm walking around and you see all the, the college coach uh, swag. Everybody's decked out watching games. And, and, and my daughter, who's only in eighth grade at this point, um, you know, it's like, oh, there's so-and-so college and so-and-so school. And, and it's like, yeah, they can't talk to you. You know, and like, I mean, it's just the way it is. Like, um, and, and I think a lot of parents don't understand that. So, so they can't talk to you until it's like the summer in between sophomore and junior year. Um, then, so when should parents and, players start reaching out to schools though because if if you're not getting on their list or, or or their radar until you're a junior on the girl side uh, it, sometimes that's a little late now on the boys side it's slightly different but what what are you seeing uh, or how should how should players you know manage that kind of minefield of timing yeah um you're spot on in that the women's soccer recruits earlier, um, men's soccer is still a little bit later. Um, I would say a couple of things. I mean, you can always send your stuff in at any time and they can look at it. They just can't call you back or text you back. Um, the, other, the other big thing is camps. You know, if you if you have the means and you and you can get there and you can go to a college camp, that's a that's a great way for coaches to see you and and you to get to know the coaches and see if that would be a good fit too. Cause I mean, sure you want to get recruited, but you need to make sure that where you're going is a good fit for you too. And I, I would feel like camp is a, would be a great way to do that. So, you know, let's just say you're, you're a freshman. We've talked about making sure that you're on the right track from a course perspective and you're, you're reaching out to coaches going to camps, just know they're not going to talk to talk back to you until you're a junior. Mm -hmm. um, what about, grades and, and test scores and, and that sort of thing as you're, as you're navigating your way through? I mean, you always want to do as best you can. Um, it's the NCAA standard for GPA and test score is actually quite low. And I think that's intentional. I think the NCAA feels like if you are admitted to the school you want to go to, then you should be able to play. Um, while maintaining some type of level playing field. And so the the bottom, the low level GPA that you have to have in division one is 2.3. Um, I believe division two is still 2.0. I haven't been in a division two school for a few years, but it, I'm pretty sure it's still 2.0. And so, you know, that's low. And, and frankly, soccer student athletes tend to have pretty good GPAs. <laughs> we don't, we don't worry about them so much. 
Um, test scores are interesting because a lot of schools, my current school, Xavier included, they've gone to test score optional. Oh, wow. So you don't even have to submit a test score to be admitted to Xavier. It, the NCAA still requires that test score, although they have not for the last two years because of COVID. And so it'll be interesting to see if they just leave it. We all kind of feel like it's it's unnecessary. If they have the two, three and they have, and they took real classes that will prepare them to do well in college. Um, so that'll be interesting to see, uh, you know, I think they'll want to maybe study it a little more to see what the impact was on having students who didn't take the SAT or the ACT and then like, did they end up graduating from college? Was there an impact or not? Um, so I'm, it'll be interesting to see if they bring it back for two years so that that cohort is through, or if they just say, you know what, they're doing fine so far, let's, let's get rid of it. Um, so yeah, but, but all of that said, in soccer, the full scholarship the full soccer scholarship is pretty rare. Um, and so you'll want to get a high GPA and a high test score to help get more academic merit aid at your institution. So um, don't be just pushing for that two, three, because you can, <laughs> you'll hurt your chances to get Right, it. right. Okay. Um, well, that's interesting on the test score thing. Um, mm -hmm. So fast forward, kid, kids, you know, gone through high school, 4.0, great test scores, took all the classes they need. Can they just go and play college soccer or is there something else they need to do in order to make sure they're allowed and eligible and all those things? Yeah, so every every high school student who is going to play division one or two or three NCAA sports will need to register with the NCAA eligibility center. And that it used to be called the clearinghouse. It was maybe a more accurate term because they were just making sure everybody's adequately prepared for the rigors of being a college student athlete. And so um, you'll just register. They, they will ask questions about your participation history to make sure that you have not professionalized yourself. Um, so they certify that amateur status and then they certify your academic eligibility as well. And so they'll, they'll go through and check your core courses, check your GPA. Um, if they bring back the test score, they'll check your test score. So all of that needs to be submitted to the eligibility center. Um, your high school, that's where you'll need to go talk to your guidance counselor again, ask him or her to send your transcript, your official transcript to the eligibility center. Um, if you go to more than one high school, you have to get the transcript from each high school originally, even if your courses are on your second high school, you have to, they want each one separately. Um, and then whether you take the ACT or SAT, then you go to those websites and you can have it sent to the eligibility center digitally. So it's not terrible, but of course there are fees for all of that, right? So I, I think we're up to $90 registration fee for the eligibility center. Um, and then there are always small fees to have your test score sent as well. So, yeah, so yeah what, but what? Um, if you're, the NCA has, they've gotten better about um, looking at students' records earlier on. So they'll, they'll sort of, they were finding that students who presented a certain level of GPA and a certain number of core courses always ended up, 99% of the time ended up being qualifiers, which is what they call someone who's ready to, um, to play and is eligible right away as a freshman. And so now they'll certify it like after your junior year, if you've got 12 core courses done and you have a, over a three GPA, then they'll go ahead and certify you. So it's been nice so that the student doesn't have to stress over the summer, the, the compliance person doesn't have to stress over the summer um, to make sure that they're gonna make it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a necessary step. It's It's not a big deal, but it's something you have to do. Um, and I will say if we have anybody that is not from the United States that's, that's watching this or listening, uh, you still also have to go through the clearinghouse and the hoops are uh, a, a little bigger um, and there's certain um, uh, equivalencies uh, in classes and sometimes that can be a little bit, uh, you know, a little bit challenging. Uh, but for, for those U.S.-based students, it, it shouldn't be too much uh, of a big deal. But you know, old grizzled guys like me, you'll always hear us call it the clearinghouse because uh, that's what it was when 
well, when I, when I went to college and uh, when I was coaching, it was still a cleric now. So, um, <laughs> anyway, um, well, you mentioned, you mentioned scholarships, um, and that the, yes, the, the, the full ride in soccer is, is not that common. I think that's a, it's a huge misconception, uh, out there that, uh, that schools are just handing out, uh, full rides. Um, but, I think what many folks don't understand is that the NCAA actually limits how many scholarships a school can give out, first of all, in each sport. And second of all, it's up to the school to decide whether they fully fund that amount of scholarships. Um, and and it, 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 now at the Division One level, I would say, would, wouldn't you agree that most schools are fully funded? Um, yes. but you've also, you've been at division two schools. I was at a division two school. It's not quite always fully funded once you get to division two, right? Yes. Yeah. It's, I, I have found that soccer has become, most schools will, uh, whether they publicize it or not, they will tier their sports. So you have your priority sports and then you have the other ones that are still very important, but they're not funded at as high of a level. Feels like you know, your football, volleyball, basketball, and soccer are the ones that are, are top tier more often than not. So it's good, good to hear that and, soccer's moving on up in the world. Right. <laughs> um, so, I mean, so how many, how many scholarships are available and, and what does a scholarship cover? Like when we say a full scholarship, what, what all does that mean? Yeah. A uh, full scholarship will cover your um, tuition fees room board books so your tuition any student fee or course fees your dorm bill your meal plan and your books um in women's soccer the team gets 14 scholarships and those are but you it, you're not going to see 14 girls with a full scholarship and then the other 15 with nothing it's 14 and they break them up and spread them around to uh, you know typically people will carry between 30 and 35 on a, on a women's soccer roster. Um, men's soccer is 9.9. .9. I don't ask me why it's not 10, but it's 9.9. .9. <laughs> and same thing. They also will have about 30 guys on a, on a squad and they're splitting up those 9.9 .9 among all 30. So you mentioned earlier, you know, make sure you get the good grades. So you get the academic merit. So if most kids, let's just, well, let's make it easy for us because it's morning and I can't do math right now. Um, let's say each kid's getting a half scholarship, right? What, you know, if I, you know, super smart, can I get a half of athletic money and a half scholarship of, of academic money? At most schools, yes. Most schools, you can, you can kind of stack your aid. And so maybe you get academic money or need-based money from the institution um, that can stack with your athletic aid. And so we, I've seen coaches can be very, there's a couple different ways that they could offer a scholarship. Um, a coach could say, and I'm gonna stick with your easy math. A coach could say, let's say a full scholarship is $40,000. So a coach could say, I'm gonna give you $20,000 in soccer scholarship. Or they could say, I'm going to give you a 50% scholarship. Or they might say, I'm going to give you, I'm going to cover your full tuition, only tuition, when we combine your soccer and your academic aid. Those are kind of the three ways that I've seen most commonly. Um, if, you, if you're in a position to negotiate, pro tip parents, um, you know, tuition and fees and room and board are always going to go up during your students four years in school. I don't care where they go. So if you can, if, if a coach is saying $20,000, if you can, you might say, how about we make that 50%? Because then if you have a, a percentage, then your dollar amount will increase as does tuition, room and board. If you just get $20,000, then you're going to be on the hook for more as the years go by. So if you're in a position, you might not be, and the coach might not be either, right? He's got a budget for 30 kids um, and four years out and forecasting that, um, but if you can. 
<laughs> try to get that percentage. Okay. Um, I mean, do, I mean, I know on the money side of things, there's, there's the scholarships, the school can offer grants. There's the need-based money you mentioned that are loans or, or federal loans, or even the school has specific things. Mm -hmm. And then you got outside, uh, grants and scholarships offered by, um, private businesses or, or other things. So it, do those factor in at all or in terms of stacking, in terms of just being able to cover the cost is, you know, does that, would getting any of that factor into how much or how little you got on a, on a athletic scholarship? Yeah, it it shouldn't impact how much you get athletically, although it could, because those, I think, well, both sides, men's and women's, you've got those equivalency limits and that is, like in men's soccer, we'll just use men's soccer for this example. They've got 9.9 .9 scholarships, but that also means they that dollar amount, whatever 9.9 .9 .9 is at that institution, there are certain kinds of aid that are not soccer scholarships that have to count toward that 9.9. .9. Um, and because that's your team NCA limit. This is a little getting in the weeds a little bit, but important to understand. Um, so a lot of those, so any academic merit aid, the NCA recently changed that rule. So if, if you were given something by the school based on your academic performance in high school, that that is exempt and that does not count toward that 9.9, .9, the team limit. So that's great at a school like most private schools, including Xavier, because Xavier's pretty um, generous when it comes to academic merit aid. They, each, each student here is getting a pretty good chunk of change <laughs> um, in terms of academic merit. And so that can stack. And then that academic merit aid doesn't hurt the team. It doesn't count against the team equivalency. Other types of aid will count against the team equivalency. So you talk about the outside scholarships. I think you should definitely still go for them. But if it is tied in any way to athletics, so if it's your high school booster club that gave you an award, if even if it's like your local Kiwanis club, but part of the criteria was that you were a, an athlete, that money now will count toward the team limit. Um, it tends to be, you know, a thousand dollars here and there, which is always like a lot of, it's a lot of money to a student or a family, but it might not hit the equivalency too bad, but be aware that there are some cases where you might either not be able to accept that outside scholarship or the school might have to reduce your athletic scholarship in order to make room for the other one. So um, it, it does come up honestly, and especially in soccer when you've got 30, 35 students all trying to fit into those 9.9 .9 equivalencies. So makes, makes sense. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> well, let's, uh, let's kind of, hit the last set of questions here. We'll, but this time we're going to assume that all has gone well and we're now in college, um, you know, and, and we're, we're ready to go. So what, you know, you, like I said, you've been blessed to, to work in a lot of different uh, college athletic departments and see a lot of, uh, of the of the good, the bad, and the ugly, I'm sure. But what are some of the, I guess, traits, commonalities uh, of, of student athletes that you see that have, that end up having a successful athletic and academic career as a student athlete? Hmm. I think the ones who have a level of independence already um, in high school, which is, it can be hard to establish, but um, that they can work independently, that's big when they get here because there's there's a lot of support on college campuses, but you still have to take ownership of your own stuff. And then um, I think self account, like accountability for yourself is very important. And when I feel like when we see students who transfer, sometimes it's just, hey, I, I'm, I'm really good. I'm better than this program. I want to play somewhere better. That happens. Or it's the other way. Uh, coach might have 
thought this person was better than they are. They're not quite good enough to play a lot at this program. You're a good kid. You're welcome to stay and be a part of our program. But if you want to actually play, you might want to go somewhere else. That definitely happens. But sometimes you just get a kid who's just unhappy. And I feel like a lot of times it's because everything is someone else's fault. And they don't take, they don't have that kind of accountability for their own actions. And so, and again, like, that's a hard thing. To, <laughs> that's a hard thing to instill in your kid. Um, I'm trying, but <laughs> um, those, those are the things. Like, again, there's a lot of support. And on, like, especially if you're a student athlete, you have more support than a normal, a non-student athlete, because you have, you have your coaches and you have your teammates. And if you're in a division one or two program, you're gonna have academic advisors and learning specialists here to help you um, with your academics. You're gonna have um, probably a, a nutritionist in the department and you're gonna have a, um, um, a psychologist probably and some other people to help with mental health. You're gonna have a lot of resources, but you have to have the maturity and the independence to seek out the resources and, and ask for help. So um, yeah, sort of, like I said, independence and some self-awareness of um, taking ownership and then asking for help when you need it. That's when I, when we talk to students, we do some exit interviews and they usually say, I wish, we always ask them like, what do you wish you had known when you were a freshman? And they say, I wish I would have asked for help in my business curriculum earlier, you know, things like that. So, so you bring up a good point. So, you know, if, if I'm looking at schools, right. And, and shopping around for the, for the best fit, what, I mean, what are some of the things that, that, that a player or parent should be asking in terms of the support systems uh, that are available? What, you know, what, what should, what should kids be making sure the, their, their school has if, if they need this, those sort of things? Yeah. Well, depending on what level you're looking at, that's the source of those resources will be different. So if you're, if you're high major, if you're looking at Florida State, they're going to have, I mean, they probably, honestly, for women's soccer, they probably have a nutritionist for women's soccer. They're going to have an athletic trainer, maybe two, and a strength and conditioning coach, and a, a sports psychologist, and a regular psychologist, and all of those things in-house. Um, we at Xavier, as sort of a high mid major ish, <laughs> we have a lot of those resources in house, but a lot of them are part time. So we have a nutritionist, she's here two days a week. We have someone who comes and teaches yoga, she comes once a week. We have um, a sports psychologist and access to another psychologist, and, and they're just not here ev all day, every day. Right. Um, at the Division II level, you're going to have those resources on campus somewhere. They're just not going to be in the athletic department. Um, so, and, and, but typically division two schools tend to be smaller. And so you're still going to be able to be serviced, whatever you need. Um, if there's a, if there's a, if someone has a learning disability, I would suggest looking into that at the school. Most schools have something, but I would just make sure it's robust enough that you're that you're comfortable with it I, I have a kid who has an IEP so I'm pretty well versed so I know parents who have that you're going to be very well versed you're going to know what to look for you're going to know what you liked in high school and what you didn't and and make sure that there are accommodations available for your kid to be successful in college too and that and that kind of goes the, uh, the same for academic resources right like if you're having trouble in class tutoring that sort of thing yeah, if you're if you're Division One, you're going to have academic advisors and tutors right there in house. You right in the building where you your locker room is probably. Um, Division Two, mm, you might have one advisor for the whole department, so that person's going to be, you know, that's too much for one person. So they'll direct you though to other resources on campus, which are also great, just maybe not as specialized for athletes. But. Um. Well, this has been awesome. Uh, you know, any anything? Uh, it's hard. No, you don't want to see your kids struggle, but let them let them go through the struggle, and they'll come out the other side much better for it. And if you find those opportunities while they're still in your house, 
do it then so that when they get to college, <laughs> they'll be more prepared and, and ready to handle it. It's <laughs> good, good, good words of advice for sure. Well, Leslie, hey, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and, uh, and hopefully uh, I'll, I'll see you again soon, whether that's when I drive through Cincinnati or not, hopefully sooner rather than later. But uh, thanks again for your time. Of course. Thanks, Matt.